Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and that you didn't eat anything that I wouldn't eat. How's that for a challenge, right? Um, we had fabulous food from the Wellness Forum kitchen and I just thought the whole time, I'm so glad I'm a plant eater. The baked stuffed squash and the cauliflower bisque and the Thai ravioli and oh, I could go on and on. But um, anyway, that reminds me. It's time for holiday shopping for Christmas and Hanukkah, and we have fabulous things from the kitchen for that. Some of you who've been clients of ours for a long time probably remember the tins of gingerbread biscotti and low-fat kale chips and raw granola and trail mix, and we have gift boxes and all kinds of wonderful things. So I put something in the newsletter about it this week, and you can also call the office and get more information if you'd like to do some holiday shopping with us. I know that I send stuff to people every year, and they absolutely love it. It's the best the gift in the world. Now, I have to share some good news. I have a, um, uh, a spot every week on the Jazzy Vegetarian Television Show, and we've been nominated for two Taste Awards and a Best Green or Organic Program Award and for a Viewer's Choice Award. Yay! And the Create channel is now showing it. It's been showing across the country on PBS. So some of you have been watching it. I know because you email me and tell me that you like it. Uh, but Create is now starting to run it um, on January 14th. But prior to that, they're doing a Jazzy Vegetarian um, Marathon as part of a Healthy Resolutions program on January 5th and 6th. They're going to show the, they're going to run 18 episodes in two days. So anyway, that's kind of fun. And I'm really glad that uh, we'll be back for a third season as well. So let's get on to today's news. I have uh, a couple, three things I want to talk about. And the first one is hypertension. And this is a real important issue because so many people have been diagnosed and are being diagnosed daily with hypertension in the United States. And I'll just back up and say our discussion of healthcare in this country, in my opinion, is so misdirected because we just keep talking about how we're going to pay for it instead of whether or not we ought to be doing it. There are so many drugs and tests and procedures that just are not valuable. And so that's why I'm talking about hypertension today. You know, Dr. John McDougall and Dr. Gilbert Welch, um, Dr. McDougall, I think you all know, Dr. Gilbert Welch wrote a book called Overdiagnosed, which I've covered a lot um, in my messages and articles. And, and they both have talked about the inadvisability of um, prescribing drugs for people with mild hypertension, which is defined as systolic pressure of 140 to 159 and diastolic pressure of 90 to 99. A recent meta-analysis confirms that medicating these people is a bad idea. The analysis included four randomized trials with 9,000 participants that compared drug treatment with placebo. Drug treatment did not result in reduced mortality, stroke, heart disease, or total cardiovascular events. However, 9% of the people in these studies dropped out because of the side effects of the drugs, which include constipation, dehydration, dizziness and lightheadedness, uh, drowsiness, dry mouth, frequent urination, headaches, potassium loss, swollen and bleeding gums, and upset stomach. That's a lot to contend with for drugs that actually don't do you much good at all. Now, the study is an important one, first of all, because it was done by Cochrane. And Cochrane is the most independent medical research uh, group in the world, so I think their information is much more reliable than most. Um, but Cochrane's not the only medical group that's come to this conclusion. In fact, the 2004 British Hypertension Society Guidelines for Hypertension Management recommended the same thing. They basically said that patients with high blood pressure should all be educated about diet and lifestyle change, and only those who um, have persistent systolic blood pressure of 160 or higher and diastolic blood pressure of 120 or 100 or higher should be placed on medication. So half the patients who are taking drugs for hypertension fall into the category of mild or high normal hypertension, which means that half the people taking drugs for hypertension shouldn't be taking those drugs. Now, if you are one of those people, do not just stop taking your drugs. You need to see your doctor so that you can be dosed down properly on the drugs. It's a bad idea with some of them to just stop taking them abruptly. So let me suggest that you either go back to your doctor with a discussion along with perhaps some printed evidence, which you can get from the Health Briefs Online Library about this issue, or find a new doctor who reads the medical literature and can help you take care of yourself properly. 
All right, the other thing I want to talk about, I actually have two articles I want to cover, both related to the same thing, which is GI health, gastrointestinal health in babies and infants. And let's just start with some foundational information. Babies begin to acquire beneficial bacteria during birth. In fact, colonies of beneficial bacteria increase during the last trimester of pregnancy in order to facilitate this. So when a baby is born via C-section, there's an automatic disadvantage because babies then acquire their beneficial bacteria from the hospital environment. Um, now, the next way that babies develop uh, bacteria is through breastfeeding. And so if babies are not breastfed, they develop different combinations of bacteria in their GI tract. So a C-section formula-fed baby is at a disadvantage and has increased risk of all kinds of things, ranging from breathing disorders to diseases as serious as Crohn's disease. Many studies have shown a link between probiotic supplements and decreased risk of respiratory illnesses and colds in infants and children, which is confirmed in a recent study where researchers enrolled 109 infants, um, one month old infants, and randomly assigned them to take probiotics or placebo twice a day for eight months. And the kids taking the probiotics did significantly better in terms of reduced incidence of respiratory illness than the kids who were taking the placebo. Now, the results would have been even better if the probiotics had been combined with a program of dietary excellence like the one that we recommend here at the Wellness Forum um, because, uh, because none of that was done. It was simply to test the probiotics. I think the results were excellent and statistically significant, but not as good as they could have been. Now, another illness related to this or condition related to the very same issue is eczema which has, it's an inflammatory skin condition that has become very common in childhood. Uh, it affects between 10 and 20% of all infants. Older children suffer from it too, and adults. Um, it's considered an autoimmune condition or a delayed immune development issue in children. Most kids are not outgrowing it these days, and more and more people are developing it every day. The treatments are beginning, the beginning of treatment usually is topical to relieve the discomfort and then sometimes steroids are used and um, steroids actually relieve it for a while but it doesn't go away and there's only so much steroids you can take before you run into a problem. So how do we get rid of the eczema? Well, it's caused by diet. Dairy is a major trigger and so are high gluten foods um, with like barley, rye, oats and wheat. And I need to insert this here. Please do not take this. The grains are bad for you. They're just bad for people they're bad for, just like nuts aren't necessarily bad for you, but if you go into anaphylactic shock when you eat them, they're bad for you, okay? So um, for most people, grains are fine, but for a certain subset of people, they tend to cause a problem. And then gastrointestinal health, particularly negative changes in the colonies of bacteria is also a factor. Um, one thing that I have observed in my own office is the people coming in here with eczema usually have a lot of other health issues too. I rarely uh, see an adult who their only issue is eczema. They usually have breathing issues and chronic infections and gas and bloating and fatigue and all kinds of other things going on. So how do you resolve the eczema? Adopt the program of dietary excellence we talk about here at the Wellness Forum and take probiotics. Recent studies showed that kids taking probiotics showed improvement in markers for eczema. Um, this research was done by Korean researchers who enrolled 118 kids with eczema between the age of 1 and 13 and they were randomized to take either a probio probiotic or a placebo. And um, their scores got better, the eczema got better. The researchers reported that the benefits only lasted during the intervention program, weren't sustained afterwards. And of course, I would come back to the same thing I said with the previous study, which is that if dietary changes had been made at the same time, the results would have persisted over time. There's no reason why you can't just get rid of the eczema, like you can get rid of the asthma and other respiratory problems that kids tend to have with a program of diet, uh, dietary improvement, and probiotics. So all of this just emphasizes the importance of GI health and paying good attention to your gastrointestinal tract, keeping it in good working order. So that's all for now. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think ought to be seeing it, and um, I will be back to you on Thursday.